From behind one podium after another, Western leaders and their lackeys talk more and more openly about a liberal world order. The more I hear and see about a world ordered by self-described liberals and their rules, the less I like it. I certainly don't recall ever being invited to vote for it. economic forum seems to be sprinkled on everything these days like a flock of birds with hardcore case of diarrhea flew over the playground so nobody wants to play there anymore i'm sorry you got a picture of bird diarrhea i did yeah it's disgusting just so i could make that analogy it is disgusting i went out of my way what we're dealing with is disgusting well i just wanted people to know i didn't want there to be any confusion Back when we were first discussing it, not that many people seemed to know that much about it. And then it was just referred to as Davos. Two years ago, I gave scant thought to acronyms like WHO, UN, WEF. Now I watch them with the same attention I give to dogs that look like they might bite. Now the acronym is WEF, and it's all over the place like a bad smell. And more and more people know exactly what that smell is especially now that it would seem more obvious by the day that this organization is wielding undue influence in the world in a way that no one voted for in the first place. WEF and its Blue Rooms find their humble beginnings back in 1971 when it was founded by Klaus Schwab, a man who has to realize by now that he comes off as someone straight out of central casting from a Bond film and who it has been imagined by many sits around in a dark room somewhere stroking a white cat. And when Dr. Evil gets angry, Mr. Bigglesworth gets upset. While coming up for the themes of his organization's annual summits, which are things like shaping the post-crisis world, which he came up with after the 2008 financial crisis, or global redesign in 2010, or as most people now know all too well, the Great Reset. First, um... What is the objective? So people assume uh, we are just going back uh, to the good old world which we had um, and everything will be normal again in how we are used to normal in the old fashion. This is, uh, let's say, fiction. The effect will be much similar to uh, world war and actually all countries in the world are affected. The pandemics has reminded us how um, interdependent we are in the world, how we are part of a global destiny, a common global destiny. Which he published a ready-to-go co-written book about in the summer of 2020, just a few months after the S hit the F, because Mr. Schwab has stated and quoted himself on the official left website that he sees these worldwide traumatic events as windows of opportunity. And of course, a unique opportunity to reset our global agenda for his institution to intensify their programmatic efforts never let a good crisis go to waste and when crises don't just happen we make them happen something like that right you never want a serious crisis to go to waste and what i mean by that it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before so let's use this uh, window of opportunity and let's recreate a global framework and by the by even the Wikipedia page for Herr Schwab admits that his parents moved to Germany during the Third Reich in order for his father to assume the role of director at Escher Weiss AG, which is a company that during World War II was a supplier for the Nazi war effort, manufacturing flamethrowers and researching and developing turbines to produce heavy water for the creation of nuclear weapons for the Nazis. So not even a conspiracy theory, it's just there. But in the beginning, WEF wasn't WEF. It was actually EMF, the European Management Forum. And the participants, it's probably not well known, but they pay to attend this thing. And that first year, 1971, it was listed in here as being 500 pounds a person. Ten years later, it had already grown to the point where they were charging about $4,200 a person to show up. By 2009... Newspapers were reporting that it costs over $50,000 to send an executive to this forum. But now in 2020, according to Forbes, the price tag has gone up to $60,000 to $600,000 to have a membership to WEF, plus an additional fee needed to acquire an attendance badge, which runs another $27,000 per person 
to get into the conference. <laughs> and Forbes writes, clearly this rarefied event excludes the average person to which the event is meant to help. Help. And while the shiny PR packaging of WEF is all about improving the world, one blue room at a time, its board of trustees includes people who stand to benefit financially from their relationship with WEF and the agendas that they produce and promote here. People like Al Gore, or the chairman and CEO of BlackRock, or the chairman of Mitt Romney's Bain. Corporations are people, my friend. Or the supervisory board chairman of Royal Phillips, who also happens to be climate leader of the World Bank Group and listed as a, quote, champion of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. Or David Rubenstein, co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group. Or the two guys from Siemens. Or the chair and CEO of Accenture, which is all over this U.S. CBDC digital dollar project and things like digital ID and digital passports, which they unveiled the testing of in Canada at Davos back in 2018. So it must be really nice that the CEO of Accenture sits on the board of trustees for WEF with people like Christia Freeland, the deputy prime minister and minister of finance in Canada. So you're confirming that accounts have been frozen, both personal and corporate, but you're not releasing the information. See how that works? Well, that's totally what's creepy about Davos. It's one of those public-private partnership things that technically has no jurisdiction at all and no official powers, but unofficially it gets government people, business people together in a room, and policies are ironed out, and they are coordinated. They're hand in glove. They are um, just magically showing up in all the places where you have a vice president in the United States or you have a commissioner of something in Europe. And it is creepy because these policies are entering into government and affecting people's lives, and yet they're being agreed upon in places where people weren't elected to represent people. It's a creepy non-government, non-governmental government. And then in boot, you know, they just mix together propagandizing to the public so that whatever they say there just sounds like what is inevitable and what you have to accept. I mean, all these guys are up there being trustees alongside people like Christine Lagarde, who's president of the European Central Bank. You have the managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva. With digitalization of all aspects of our lives, you have the Director General of the World Trade Organization. You have former Governor of the Bank of England and current UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance, Mark Carney. As Carney stated, the transition to a low-carbon economy will also bring its own risks and opportunities. Reassessments of the values of virtually every financial asset. Firms that align their business models to the transition to a net-zero world will be rewarded handsomely. Those that fail to adapt will cease to exist who also happens to be on the board of directors for the Bank of International Settlements. Basically, this is the central bank of the central banks. So it's meta. If you're a parent and you'd like to explain what the Bank of International Settlements is to your small children, the easiest thing to do is just show them that clip from Harry Potter where they go to the Gringotts Wizarding Bank, because it's like an underground place that's, you know, complete with 800-year-old gnome-looking dudes, and the only way to escape is on a fire-breathing dragon, okay? Director General for the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN, is also on the Board of Trustees. Basically, this is the public face of, like, Bilderberg, except they have the branded logo, step and fetch, product placement plug thing behind the celebrity billionaires and politicians. But this is a unified agenda, for sure. And also you have Yo-Yo Ma, which, I don't know, for some reason might be the most disturbing one. And then the unassuming shadows, right? Then you get over here to the business partners, the corporations that are cozied up here with the WEF. And this is hundreds of major corporations. I mean, it would just be easier to list you off the mega corporations that aren't partnered with WEF. WEF is largely funded by its 1000 member companies, which are typically global enterprises that have more than $5 billion in turnover. And every year they're meeting at this elite retreat in Davos, Switzerland, where the attendance includes over 100 billionaires, over 300 public figures. This is the list of confirmed public figures this year. 
And as you can see, you've got heads of state, government, foreign affairs, finance, economy, central banks are represented there. I mean, you even have defense and intelligence chiefs going to this thing. So you have everybody, basically. And by the way, it also notes on here that over 300 of these people like to fly in by way of private jet. So while they're lecturing us all on the costs of climate change, it's as if no one here ever heard of the concept of hypocrisy. Supposedly, WEF purchases carbon credits to offset all these private jet flights. Credits which WEF Board of Trustee member Al Gore over here is heavily, heavily invested in and which the Institute of Local Self-Reliance points out that the link between the purchase of these carbon offsets and the actual reduction of carbon emissions is not only highly controversial, but almost impossible to actually verify. So on an aside, the whole program just goes to show you that rich people can continue to pollute the environment at a rate which is actually much more significant than the average person ever could, and then afford to launder away their green guilt because they have the money to do so while trying to tell the rest of us how much they care about climate change in a way that's somehow supposed to come off as authoritative and legitimate. I mean, these people who attend WEF are not just shelling out 60 grand plus so they can hang out in blue rooms all day and eat hors d'oeuvres and chit chat with people who make this face. But obviously to advance personal and financial interests. I mean, that's not really a shocking thing to say. It's, and as you can see, there's a few good reasons why people might not trust the World Economic Forum. It shouldn't be considered controversial that I said that. At some point in the past, and I missed that point too, whenever it was, I'll freely admit, the governing class decided they were done with serving us and that they own us and rule us instead. That cancerous thought has metastasized in recent years so that it's not just governments and their bureaucrats and preferred scientists who presume to lord it over us to tell us what to do, what to think. That same deranged thought is there throughout the greediest capitalist corporations now as well. I actually kind of find it completely hilarious I saw that this year's motto was, and you can't even really make this one up, working together, restoring trust. Because that is where authority ultimately has to come from a place of in order to be legitimate, trust. Trust is defined as an assured resting of the mind on the integrity, veracity, justice, friendship, or other sound principle of another person, confidence, reliance, or credit given. Credit is a circular definition that comes back around a trust, because it's defined as a reliance on the truth of something said or done, belief, faith, trust, confidence, reputation derived from the confidence of others, from the Latin credere, to trust, loan, believe. And authority is also related to trust. It's defined as the legal or rightful power, a right to command or act, power exercised by a person in virtue of his office or trust. So ultimately, that's where the power of authority comes from. Otherwise, it has to be tyrannically enforced via coercion and violence, which is never considered legitimate. All these words, authority, power, credit, trust, they're all intimately connected concepts that are based upon one another. And now they think they're going to somehow, after everything that has occurred with them and all the things that are going on right now, they're going to restore trust in this globalist world order that they're working on. Well, we've, we've been onto this agenda for several years. I mean, as people have stopped trusting people who hold authority and realizing what a bunch of BS so many things in the public sphere are, and as many people have caught on to their rather conspiratorial and controlling behavior, and they have lost trust, they have spun this into the disinformation narrative. The technocrats took free speech by the throat long ago so as to preserve and push their own self-described progressive ideologies. Now that same superiority complex is everywhere else as well. And they have spun this into a secondary definition that trust doesn't mean believing that they're not up to no good and that what they say is probably what they mean and what they say is uh, either true or what they attend, they're spinning trust to be more like a verification, like I Twitter trust you because I blue check mark verify you, right? And so we've already seen where they've taken news consortiums, <laughs> ironically led by Hearst 
Publishing, uh, who used to be officially in the yellow journalism business. And they've taken these news organizations to validate each other and say, we're going to verify that these are trustworthy, accredited, authoritative news sources. And therefore, those that aren't accredited by us are not trustworthy because they're probably spreading disinformation. It's that form of trust. Okay. And so who do you think they are going to trust and try to convince the public they're going to trust? That's right. It's each other. But it's that part of the plot where you realize that when you turn to the judge or call the police to report the assailant, that's when you realize they're in on it together and you're screwed. You know the part of the plot I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Yeah. The person in peril is like, oh, help. Uh, they are trying to. Uh. Oh, you have the gleam in your eye. You are. You're that. You're that, you're that guy. Yeah, that's your kid. You're in on it the that's whole your time. spouse yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I, uh, oh, f <laughs> Exactly. That is why when you have leaked files coming out showing companies like, say, multi-billion dollar Uber attending WEF in 2016 and using that as a base to set up over 100 meetings with public officials from 18 countries and European Union institutions some of which then turned around and instituted policies in their countries that affected taxi drivers' jobs in order to aid the expansion of Uber in Italy, for example, or getting France's Macron to overturn policies that were put in place by French legislators that directly banned one of Uber's services. Well, now people are calling out WEF directly for its involvement. Because adding two plus two together is something that even small children can do. Or what's happening right now in the Netherlands with the nitrogen, where thousands of farmers have taken to the streets and been joined by groups in Germany, Italy, Spain, and Poland, as people across Europe are becoming increasingly angry that it appears their food is being targeted by what is being referred to outright in places as, quote, WEF agendas. The Netherlands may be a smaller country, but with nearly 54,000 agribusinesses, it's the world's second largest exporter of agricultural goods. And they just instituted new climate change policies that are calling for a 30% reduction of livestock in order to drastically curb nitrogen oxide and ammonia emissions by the year 2030, which is a year that might ring a bell for more than a few of you by now. Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte, just so happens to be a WEF Agenda contributor and attendee. And during this year's Davos meeting, he apparently came out while it was going on and did an interview where he stated that there's a limit to what government can do and you cannot help everyone, so we in the West will be a bit poorer because of high inflation and high energy costs. The we, of course, does not include him or the people that go to WEF. In fact, Mr. Rutt was recently called out on his WEF ties, including last summer when he was directly confronted by Dutch politician Gideon Van Meerzeren regarding a letter Rutt wrote to Her Rutt wrote Rutt, Rutt row. a letter Rutt wrote a letter that Rutt sent to Herr Schwab involving his Great Reset book. Voorzitter, steeds meer mensen zien dat het een grote leugen is dat het huidige coronabeleid ertoe dient om onze volksgezondheid te beschermen. Maar dat roept natuurlijk wel de vraag op waarom dan al die afschuwelijke maatregelen worden getroffen die onze hele manier van leven, onze hele samenleving kapot maken. Nu zijn er een aantal invloedrijke globalisten die naar eigen zeggen de coronacrisis zien als een enorme kans om onze wereld te resetten en dus een pervers belang hebben om deze crisis nog even voor te laten duren. En een van deze globalisten is de heer Klaus Schwab, oprichter en voorzitter van het World Economic Forum. En hij heeft ook een boek geschreven met als pakkende titel COVID-19, The Great Reset. En mijn vraag aan de demissionair minister-president is hoe beoordeelt hij de inhoud van dit boek? De minister-president. Ik ken het boek niet, voorzitter. Maar ik zou de heer Van Meijeren willen adviseren om niet al te veel in al die conspiratietheorieën... Hoor. Ik, ik kijk ze ook allemaal op YouTube. Ik vind het altijd fascinerend hoe dan uitgelegd wordt dat 9-11 niet heeft plaatsgevonden... of dat het allemaal anders zit. Ontzettend knap in elkaar gezet. Maar het is meestal wat het is, een conspiratietheorie. De heer Van Meijeren. Nou, het verbaast mij dat de eerste vraag die ik aan de heer Rutte stel... sinds ik beëdigd ben als Kamerlid direct wordt beantwoord... Ook niet. Dank u wel, maar het... Verbaas mij dat die eerste vraag direct wordt beantwoord met een leugen. Ik heb namelijk een brief in mijn hand die dateert van 26 november 2020. En dat is een brief van de heer Rutte aan de heer Klaus Schwab. Waarin hij de heer Schwab bedankt voor het toezenden van zijn ja. boek. En dit noemt een 
hoopvolle analyse voor een betere toekomst. Zou de heer Rutte nog even kunnen graven in zijn geheugen? Het is nog geen half jaar geleden, dus ik weet niet hoe lang uw herinneringen actief blijven. Maar waarschijnlijk is dit nog wel ergens op te graven. En mijn eerste vraag opnieuw te beantwoorden en nu eerlijk, alstublieft. Nou, het eerlijke antwoord is dat dat een, een, een nette brief is. Waarin je uh, helaas niet alle boeken die je toegestuurd krijgt van kast tot kast kunt lezen. Maar wel degene die je toestuurt een vriendelijke brief wil terugsturen. Nou, dan zegt de heer Rutte dus eigenlijk dat hij niet heeft gelogen tegen mij, maar tegen de heer Klaus Schwab. Ik, ik was maar laat ik dan hier direct alsnog de vraag stellen. De heer Klaus Schwab, die Doe pleit in zijn hoek voor het resetten van onze wereld. Om onze nationale parlementaire democratie te vervangen door een globale technocratie. Hij pleit ervoor dat er een einde komt aan privébezit. En de heer Rutte is er kennelijk niet eens van bewust dat hij dit een hoopvolle boodschap voor een betere toekomst heeft genoemd. Hoe is het mogelijk dat de heer Rutte een waardeoordeel hecht aan een boek met een neocommunistische boodschap, terwijl hij dat boek niet eens gelezen heeft? Dank u wel, de minister-president. Jongen, Klaus Schwab is oprichter van het World Economic Forum. De man heeft zijn hele leven in dienst gesteld om de private sector, politiek, NGO's bij elkaar te brengen om een dialoog te voeren hoe je deze wereld verder kunt helpen. Ik heb het grootst mogelijke respect voor hem. Ik ben het niet met alles met hem eens. Ik heb het andere boek van hem wel gelezen over de vierde industriële revolutie. Dat vind ik wel een erg mooi, mooi boek. Dit boek niet. Hier is uh, zo vol Dus uh, ja, persoonlijk groot respect voor uh, professor Klaus Schwab en, 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 en zijn levenswerk met het World Economic Forum, wat denk ik van groot belang is als platform om elkaar te kunnen ontmoeten. Waar ook heel veel jonge mensen een kans krijgen, waar... Uh, van grote vraagstukken rondom klimaat, uh, milieutransities en energietransities tot en met hoe we hè, onze toekomstige industrie goed kunnen opzetten, discussies plaatsvinden en volle openheid voor iedereen zichtbaar. Uh, dus uh, geen reden om te twijfelen aan de intenties van Klaus Schwab. Mm -hmm. De heer Van Meijeren. Nou, slot, want ik zou zo eigenlijk ook nog graag een interruptie aan de demissionair minister De Jonge willen stellen. Maar ik zou het wel zo netjes vinden als de heer Rutte even corrigeert richting Klaus Schwab. Dat hij helemaal niet vindt dat zijn boek een hoopvolle uh, boodschap voor een betere toekomst biedt. Dat hij het niet heeft gelezen en dat hij dit geen goed boek vindt, zoals hij in zijn laatste reactie zegt. Dat lijkt me toch het minste wat we van een die, die eerlijke minister-president kunnen verwachten. Die samenvatting laat ik even voor de spreker. Maar de heer Schwab volgt op de voet alle Tweede Kamerdebatten. Dus dat komt goed. So that'll turn out well. I mean, look at this letter. Look at it. He's using the phrase build back better. Where have we heard that one before? Mm-hmm. So Rutt named Christiane van der Waal Zegelink as his first minister for nature and nitrogen policy, which is apparently a thing now. And I'm obviously not from the Netherlands, but the claim is that she is married to Piet van der Waal. And I did find a 2019 obituary for Aki van der Waal showing a Christiane van der Waal Zegelink married to a Piet with four children. And her wiki page states that she's married with four children. But the claim is that the Van der Waal family is quite wealthy and heavily invested in the grocery business there. A business that has the ability to decide what kinds of foods are offered to the public for sale. What kind of foods, you say? Including a rather new online electric car delivery based green grocery store chain that's in at least 200 cities and growing called Picnic. Picnic, as it turns out, recently received millions in funding last year from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Gates himself being not only the largest private owner of farmland in the United States and buying up thousands more acres all the time and heavily invested in synthetic meat alternatives, including Impossible Foods, Beyond Meat, Memphis Meats and Hampton Creek Foods. But he recently came out in an interview with MIT Technology Review and stated, quote, I do think all rich countries should move to 100% synthetic beef. You can get used to the taste difference, and the claim is they're going to make it taste even better over time. Eventually, that green premium is modest enough that you could sort of change the behavior of people or use regulation to totally shift demand. Using regulation to shift demand for beef is exactly what's going to happen as a byproduct of the rut government enforcing these environmental policies on his people, even if the stated focus of those policies is nitrogen emissions. Accordingly, the Netherlands government, with Rudd at the helm, has also specifically partnered with WEF on a program called the Food Innovations Hub. 
which they launched last year. I'd like to highlight a, a World Economic Forum initiative in this regard, the World Economic uh, Forum Food uh, Innovation Hubs. And the press release describes it straight up as following the UN Sustainable Development Goals, stating, quote, we need to fundamentally change the way food is produced and consumed. This includes changing the practices of more than 500 million smallholder farms and the consumption patterns of 7.7 billion individuals. And these hubs in Africa, in Asia, in South America and in Europe uh, will allow uh, businesses to connect regional stakeholders to skill innovations because this is key, a skill innovation that can address food systems, challenge, food systems challenges. So they're straight up admitting all of these corporations and WEF are aligned with an agenda to change the way food is produced and consumed by everyone and to change the way that 500 million smallholder farmers farm. Oh, you know, just a few changes, you know, some of the people, you know, a few of your neighbors down the street and I don't know, 7.7 .7 billion of the people on the planet. You know, maybe just kind of shake things up for, I don't know, half a billion farmers. You know, we'll see what happens. These people should not have that kind of power. They should not be able to change demand for food through regulation. That is a disgusting and gross power. This food innovation hub thing is described as a key multi-stakeholder platform that will leverage technology and innovations to strengthen innovation ecosystems for, quote, food systems transformation. And Rutt is one of the main guys of this at WEF. And in the press release, he is personally quoted as saying that this is due to global food insecurity and quote, this stresses the need to redesign how we produce and consume food. The Netherlands is committed to forming partnerships that will catalyze the innovations that are needed to address food system challenges. I am therefore proud to announce that the Netherlands will host the Global Coordinating Secretariat of the Food Innovations Hub. Uh, I am particularly proud to announce that the Netherlands will host the Global Coordinating Secretariat of the World Economic Forum Food Innovation Hubs, which will connect all other food innovation hubs. And I believe this is important because it will be facilitating to create uh, the partnerships we need. So they just dress it up in some nice words there and make it seem all fancy and official. And then suddenly it is. Anyone can make this up. I can make a club and call it the global secretariat of whatever I want and go make myself have a blue room. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't mean I'm authoritative either. But this guy is the prime minister of the Netherlands. And like Rutt, Bill Gates is, of course, a regular attendee and panelist in WEF's blue rooms. His company, Microsoft, is partnered with WEF, WEF the international non-governmental lobbying organization that's bringing together all these major corporate stakeholders who stand to financially benefit and be directly involved in this global food transformation. But WEF is not only promoting switching en masse to a global plant-based diet, but they're also pushing the same exact impossible burgers whose company Gates is financially backing directly on their official websites. And they've had people come and talk about how we all need to eat this diet. We feed cows uh, and the cows then feed us. But the intermediary, the, the cow, is a very, very inefficient animal in terms of converting the vegetables that they eat, in the vegetable proteins, into animal edible proteins. In addition, it's increasingly known that our livestock industry is a big emitter of greenhouse gases, allegedly uh, the same as our transport industry. So those cows, and I, I, since I know these numbers, I look at cows in the pasture, and I, I think about these clouds of methane that come out of it. Well, they're admitting it right there. They're going to price people out of ordinary behavior, out of the ordinary markets that have been built up to this point. And maybe some change is good for environmental or even health reasons. I mean, at least in theory. But to change it so sharply and rapidly is obviously a punishment on people. And uh, it's it's holding them hostage economically. I mean, at the very least, this is being implemented terribly. Of course, I also don't agree with their policies, but. Or their diet. You want to eat the impossible burger? honey? I am not eating an impossible burger. That's impossible. I heard it bleeds just like real meat. Mmm. So good. So what we will see is hopefully on the one hand, 
more globalisation. It feels like there's a club somewhere or a positive feedback loop in which everyone involved, and it's definitely not us, politicians of all stripes, faceless bureaucrats, journalists, bankers and corporations, feels entitled to make all the decisions about every aspect of our lives and then to tell us how it's going to be. So why are the farmers so upset? Why are there sort of record-setting protests and buildings are being burned down and roads are blocking over this nitrogen issue? Well, it's the foot in the door to shutting down and stopping the economy, I guess, again, after the COVID thing. You know, they're claiming it's for environmental reasons. And, you know, you've heard our reports before, like CAFO lots and big agri stuff. It would be nice if that changed. There are better models available. But what we're seeing here is that under the guise of the environment and this global governance, they don't want to change that gradually. They don't want to incentivize better policies. They want to force what is now a sudden turning off of the valve, a sudden switching over so that it shocks the system and stops things. But this has been developing for a long time. I mean, first of all, uh, for European countries, this has come out of uh, the 1979 Bern Convention on Conservation of European Wildlife and Natural Habitats. Natural habitats becomes kind of an important keyword. And so they were all signatories of that. And then that got adopted uh, circa 1992 while the United Nations was having its convention on environment and development, you know, the Rio conference where they established the buzzword sustainable development. And they set these sort of biodiversity off limit goals. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. HCON Res 353 outlines a comprehensive national strategy for sustainable development in accordance with the principles of Agenda 21 to be coordinated under the leadership of a specific office and at the di direction of a high-level government official. Well, that has played out in Europe, too. Uh, because that's the same year they had adopted the Natura 2000, which is the European Commission agreement that came out of their European Natural Habitats Agreement. And they adopted that in 92, setting aside almost 20 percent of EU land as being sort of under control for environmental reasons, and maybe even more. They've encouraged the adoption of this over the years. Angela Merkel, for one, before she was Germany's leader, you know, she was a minister for Germany's environment and nature conservation department. And she urged a full implementation of this international agreement uh, back in 96. Okay. Now, jumping forward to 2010, they used uh, these old treaties on wildlife habitats and protecting environmental species to um, assess the habitat and declare a nitrogen crisis. So this nitrogen has a lot to do with dairy farming. It has a lot to do with the ammonia that comes out of the cows, a lot to do with the types of fertilizers used, but it also touches upon uh, coal and other fuel sources. It touches upon the way the houses are built and roads are made. So it it's, it's reaching into food and transportation and energy and more, you know, <laughs> it's reaching into almost all aspects of life. And they're using this nitrogen crisis pretext to lead to what's happening now. Uh, flash forward again to 2018, an EU court decision mandated that EU members have to protect vulnerable habitats and reduce nitrogen, quote unquote, because the environmentalists sued the Netherlands and made it a test case uh, for what is surely going to be all of Europe. Two years after that lawsuit, uh, dating to 2018, the Netherlands passes a law in December 2020, which I'm sure has probably been in the works for a while, um, making these nitrogen restrictions law in the Netherlands. And about a year and a half after that, in January 2022, they create a new division and name the first ever minister for nature and nitrogen. That's now a department of government, nature and nitrogen. Which doesn't even sound like a real and, title. And so Rutt appointed Christian Vanderwall, Zegerlink. But this is what they're doing. They're, they're forcing immediate 
hairpin 180 degree turns that are shutting down farms. They're forcing these farms to go out of business. In the wider world, it's the farmers who are the latest citizens pushed beyond breaking point. There are tractor protests in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Italy, in Poland. So in short, that's why they're protesting, but they're not instituting incremental change to make environmental policies better. They're just cutting off people's business, their food, their energy, their transportation, even their home and road building. And they're cutting off this energy production even while Europe itself is facing a sev severe shortage of fuel on account of the Ukraine war crisis and all the fuel that's been traditionally supplied by Russia. You know, they're doing this environmental stuff not coincidentally, I would say, at the same time uh, as this war-related stuff. The environment, the war, it's just yet another reason you didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! This isn't just about the environment, and it's not just about farmers. This is targeting everyone. When those who grow and raise the food we eat are angry and scared enough to down tools and take to the streets to fight for their very existence, when those who drive the trucks that bring us everything we depend upon for our daily lives have done likewise, perhaps it's finally time to pay attention to the unfolding catastrophe. So Rutt and Gates are in lockstep on this food transformation angle. And from what I can gather, it would appear that Rutt's Minister for Nature and Nitrogen Policy has what most would consider to be a direct conflict of interest in enforcing these climate policies that will also affect so many people's livelihoods and lives via the Gates-funded grocery store Picnic. So then, when a Picnic distribution center burns down, amid this nationwide protest that's taking place over people being extremely angry about all of these policies being slammed into place on their lives, while violence and destruction of property is not condoned and never considered the answer, it's not really a mystery what the motivation for it might be. And as a person who is heavily invested in synthetic meat alternatives, Gates also has a financial conflict of interest. As when he's publicly supporting synthetic beef and calling for so-called rich nations the world over to stop consuming natural beef and calling for regulation to shift people's demand, as one of the most influential billionaires on earth, Gates is a person who personally stands to financially benefit from literally every so-called derisive air quotes green initiative thing he does. It's pretty obvious. I shouldn't have to even say that. And this, right here, this whole thing, is just a couple of examples of how it's a really small world at WEF, and it isn't hard to see how anyone with two eyeballs and a couple of functioning brain cells to smack together could take a look at all of that and walk away with an idea that they're just... I don't know, might be a hint of corruption afoot. Maybe just a smidge of corruption to change the food habits and change demand for approximately 7.7 .7 billion individuals on this planet. <laughs> but not the exclusive 10,000. Oh, it's a forum is a community of communities, a big global stakeholder communities. Uh, community, we integrate uh, governments, business, international organizations, civil society, our uh, young global leaders, our global shapers, integrating the 10,000 uh, global shapers, leaders between 20 and 30 years uh, old, um, who not only leaders, I mean, they represent uh, society uh, in 400 different cities of the world. Um, we are also involved into about um, 100 different activities or initiatives at this moment. All this will be integrated into a big work stream. Um, and uh, the Great Reset uh, will serve as, as a platform. Uh, right? This is a non-democratic process. These are policies from appointed officials being shoved down on everyone and whoever their democratic representatives are in the respective countries are not the people making the decisions. They're maybe implementing the policy or failing to break it. But basically, nobody asks people if they want this. They already know that the majority of people do not want this, especially since no matter how bad a CAFO farm or some other kind of agriculture practice is, they're turning the spigot off rather suddenly instead of gradually. They're clamping down. I mean, this is going to be a shortage of food for people.
it's not like people are just rushing and stumbling over themselves to go eat this synthetic processed lab created wannabe meat thing uh yeah if people this actually wanted it they wouldn't have to force it i mean they put it on sale at the grocery store near our house all the time and i never see it getting less it seems like they just get rid of the old stock and put in new i don't even know how many people are actually buying this stuff anywhere I mean, I don't know if you saw it, but they got Kim Kardashian to be the spokesman of Beyond Meat. So I've stepped in to help with my greatest asset, my taste. And she had to post proof that she actually ate it. And if you watch the so-called proof, <laughs> it doesn't look like she's actually eating it. So fun. So Kim just became Beyond Meat's chief taste consultant, aka spokesperson, for this new campaign. <laughs> There's never been a better time to go beyond. And while Kim is chewing and holding that burger in the ad, fans quickly pointed out she never takes an actual bite of the food. <laughs> she then takes a selfie holding her taco, which appears to be completely uneaten. Well, what do you expect? It's a fake person with a fake ass eating fake meat. She's probably faking eating the fake meat. It's a simple change that makes a really big difference. I mean, besides, they've already proven with game shows, people eat or put anything in their mouth for money, basically. So, so what? And she's trying to act like it she's doesn't eating. mean it's food. It doesn't mean it's good. I don't know. Maybe she did eat it. But from what they're showing here, it, it does not appear that she I, there's no moment where you actually see her putting the thing in her mouth. Also, how do we know that's what that even really we, we don't know. We don't actually know. That could be an AI generated eating of the fake meat. And <laughs> approve she ate the fake meat. She had to prove it. I, but the fact that people wanted her to, I think that's. I the... assume this is fake. Can you prove that you ate the fake meat, please? Because <laughs> nobody you, Did you for real eat the fake meat or did you just fake eating the fake meat? Because, I mean, that's fake meat. So why would you eat it? I think we need to have proof that the proof. That she ate the fake meat wasn't fake. The proof is in the pudding, but the pudding is fake. <laughs> is the pudding made out of meat? I mean, fake meat. <laughs> okay. The people who go to WEF aren't so ignorant of us wee little proletariat that they fail to comprehend just how unpopular they are and have become the world over and how much public trust in them as an organization or just as people who attend this thing has eroded and continues to erode by the day as they become more well known and their objectives which they can claim all day are environmentally based but are also obviously financially based become more well known what we know is that we will end up with many more unemployed and uh, particularly also people in the gray economy which are not counted for uh, who lose their jobs so we will see definitely a lot of anger. Uh, we have seen uh, the signs of anger on the streets. So um, we have to prepare for a more angry world. I mean, these last couple of years have proven to all but the, the most obtuse how much they can use crises to shock the system economically first and how they apparently have the power to change people's habits because People are willing to comply when they think there's an emergency. So what do you think is going to come out of this? There's going to, you know, we've already seen distribution shortages and there's already been some shelves that are empty. Kind of a feeling maybe we haven't seen anything yet since they openly admit they want to change demand for basic meat and stuff. Here in the West, in the 21st century, we're being prepared not just for a future without cars, but a future of less energy, less warmth, and even less food. I knew there was something badly wrong with all that's going on when I realised my response to what was happening, to all that we're being told, was physical. All of this actually makes me feel ill to my bones. It, it makes me think that all the plant-based products you see on the shelves growing more and more numerous, that that isn't just a coincidence or just people going into the business thinking, oh, I'm going to make a product that's like this. It, it feels like they're forcing supply to later meet the forcing of demand. And by the way, there's really not a lot of evidence that it's more nutritious. Sometimes it feels like society itself has been poisoned and that all that society is being offered is yet more poisonous nonsense. 
I mean, people should decide for themselves what kind of diet they should eat, but they certainly shouldn't have it dictated to them by a technocratic board from an unaccountable, unelected, no jurisdiction having body, you know, that's part of a global government's interlocking ring system. They should, certainly shouldn't have shadowy billionaires, you know, patting the back of prime ministers in countries you don't even live in, changing the diets of the planet. I mean, maybe that's just me. I've never in my life before listened to government policy and to the policies of governments all around the world and felt endangered. But I do now, if you feel that too, a deep physiological response to the last two years and a growing sense of something malevolent, then you're not alone. The fact of the matter is, these people know that they are not trusted. And so this year, and I think this is freaking hilarious, this year, their theme was working together, restoring trust. So that should tell you how far gone they know this is, that they have to say that. And Klaus Schwab was quoted as saying that they need to establish an atmosphere of trust so they can accelerate all this collaborative action they want to do. So their whole goal is to, quote, establish an atmosphere of trust. And I'm, I just... We all know, but still pay insufficient attention to the frightening scenario of a comprehensive cyber attack, which would bring to a complete halt to the power supply, transportation, hospital services, our society as a whole. The COVID-19 crisis would be seen in this respect as a small disturbance in comparison to a major cyber attack. I have a pretty big imagination, and I'm telling you, I, I can't even fathom a way in which these people are going to be able to do that that does not involve fear and coercion. I just, I can't even, I can't even think of it. And so I think we need to finish up with this, this one speaker they had, because I feel like the fact that this guy showed up in one of the WEF Blue Rooms uh, reeks of desperation that they had to have this guy come over to one of their Blue Rooms so he could say, this business is the most trusted institution now what's happened to ngos so i think what's happened is you guys have to learn how to fight why do i say this because you've been politicized the right wing people are trying to delegitimize civil society and if you don't fight back you are going to continue to lose your position in the world so so he's giving them a conspiracy theory, okay? Their conspiracy, it's their conspiracy theory for them to try and explain away why they don't have trust. It's not simple like, oh, I don't know, you're, you're meeting with business leaders at a, an elite international non-governmental lobbying organization so that you can bring back and implement agendas we never voted for on our lives. <laughs> That's not the reason, right? It's got to be some conspiracy theory about right wing and left wing and this whole thing to try and make them feel better because they don't have public trust. Yeah, and they love to throw around words like right wing. But what he really said is, what's going on, NGOs? Uh, looks like people don't trust you because, gee, I don't know why. I don't know. It's a big, It's a big mystery. I have no clue. But listen to this. Now, I only tell you this, not like some preacher man. I tell you this with love because my wife's a social entrepreneur i watch what she does and you have to fight back you have to fight back with facts you have to fight back with personality because what's happened is the leadership of civil society has disappeared in terms of being important figures. You had to fight back. This is the disinformation thing that we've covered. They wrote about how to make yourself a personality and how to engineer trust all over again after they already figured that stuff out in the early 40s and 50s and the classic days of public relation. Now they've realized that the public has once again identified them as the controlling power hungry liars that they are and they're trying to re-engineer quote trust with the money of a giant trust i guess and what they're Literally. really doing is recognizing that since people would never in their right mind actually trust them as though they're telling the truth and representing their best interest and doing anything other than consolidating power they're going to 
engineer trust by verifying that they are the authoritative sources and patting each other on the back and then blue check marking each other. That's the type of trust he's talking about. That's the type of fighting back they're talking about by shutting down dissent and opposition by calling them disinformation and by authoritizing themselves with a, uh, the equivalent of a classy blue check mark because they own the companies. It's also not acceptable that you allow the shrinkage of mainstream media to define your presence. What's going on in the world is you have to make your own channels. The mainstream media is shrunk by half. That's the math. So stop playing the old game. Play the new game. Wait a minute. Did he just say the old game is having the mainstream media propagandize and push their agendas, but now they're down by half, so they got to do it themselves? Yeah, he's tacitly acknowledging that the mainstream media uncritically regurgitated their talking points and presented this stuff of it as if it is truth and authority. And since no one wants to watch mainstream media, they have to look to other avenues. I don't think these people getting a little YouTube channel or some Instagram at this point is really going to do a whole lot for getting anyone to actually trust them, though. But if you haven't noticed the byproduct here, it matters whether or not people believe them and trust in them. And clearly they know that people do not. You have better ability than anybody to tell these stories. Look at who you are. Look at who you are. You have the authority, so you should be able to get people to trust you. But obviously they haven't if they have to have trust as their motto of the year and have this guy up here spinning yarns for them to try and make them feel better about the fact that they know there's a wide growing tide, a siege of public distrust unmasked for these people and their agendas and what they're trying to do. I mean, the reason trust can never be restored is that people have come to the full realization that these people, whether they be prime ministers or MPs or senators and congressmen or whoever, do not represent the millions of people who may have elected them into office millions or of dollars. Who represent the, the body of the people in the given country. They represent a very tiny and unduly influential elite. They know where their bread is buttered and the people know where these so-called representative elected officials or appointed officials, they know where their bread is buttered. And that's why there can never be trust again, so long as they get their butter from a place they shouldn't. Plant-based butter. I mean, no system is ideal, but there has to be some representation and some accountability, even in extreme systems. You know, this will not stand. This cannot stand. That's what I'm saying. Like They, 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 they can, can use force, but they'll never win trust. They can film the whole entire forum and put the entire thing online. I sincerely don't believe that all of the major things that happen there are the things that are happening on a stage with spotlights and cameras aimed at it. But whatever. That's not the point. They can be as, quote, transparent as they claim they're being. And it's super obvious when you look at this with all of these major giant corporations meeting together with these public servants and them coming back into their countries and implementing these policies that directly stand to benefit these people that they pay $60,000 to go sit around in a blue room with once a year at this elite retreat. Our careful, and I mean careful attention to building and sustaining the liberal international world order it's not that hard to put all of this together and figure it out. I mean, it's really very simple. There are harder there are harder puzzles for kindergartners than what this is. It's doubly troubling. I mean, there's a lot of corrupt issues and a lot of things that need to be changed for the better. But with food, it's going into your body. This is something that fuels your body the and affects, energy that sustains you exactly and it affects your health and livelihood and we've you know we've covered a lot of these issues you've seen what happens inside the united states you know they have some new controversial measure maybe gmo and they'll open it up to public comment the usda and the fda will now hear public comment oh you all hate it okay duly noted now we're gonna pass <laughs> the regulation with no known issues just as planned but we check box the accountability we were so open we were so transparent we heard all the complaints of the people who got up at eight in the morning and registered to say that they don't want it you know, the, the scientists that were chosen by the corporations that are pushing these items, they're the ones that say it's safe. So gross. It's, it's gross. It's really sick, It's disgusting. Man. It actually is really disgusting. In Sri Lanka, they're quite a bit further down the road than us, although hardly out of sight. 
thousands of people driven beyond endurance by economic collapse and the worst food and fuel shortages in living memory found they had nothing left to lose. It feels to me as though we are literally to the point where these people could go to Davos, sit in the Blue Room, say what, say maybe the best idea they've ever had for fixing something or, or making the world a better place. And there is a growing majority of people who will reject it because that is where it's coming from. Let's also be clear. The future is not just happening. The future is built by us. Period. That is how little trust is had for these people. And there's a growing feeling of that happening from all sides, regardless of political affiliation. Even if they had the greatest idea in the world, if it's coming out of one of these WEF blue rooms, I'm pretty sure large majorities of people will start to reject it. What kind of world do we want to build? Um, so I, the fact that they know that they need to regain it is, I mean, it's kind of special that they said it since they obviously aren't stupid, but I don't know. Good luck with that. So in short, you're being depositioned. You have to fight back. And I believe you can. Thank you. We're not sure exactly why they don't like a hot poker to the ass. So we're rebranding. We're rebranding. We're going to try to get them to trust us with a hot poker in the ass. I, um, we're not <laughs> sure why there's so much resistance to this idea. So um, we have to prepare for a more angry world. Maybe if everyone who attends Davos filmed themselves eating an impossible burger or something, and we had the proof they were all eating it, maybe... The Maybe. Yeah, we already saw that video a couple years ago where Bill Gates supposedly drank the poop water. No one <laughs> believes he was drinking the poop water. We no, all know that he's not. too rich to drink poop water. They obviously just gave him regular water. I don't know if it's a camera trick or a cut or just a cynical fact that he's too rich to drink poop water and he expects the pores to drink the poop water. <laughs> Nobody believes these people. I don't think a little social media is going to do it. It's interesting to note that contrary to what Klaus Schwab and his World Economic Forum might think, it turns out that when some people find they actually do own nothing anymore, they're really not very happy at all. So I guess they're going to try and work on regaining that trust that they did. They ever even really have it to begin with. I'm not even so sure they did. I think they just really weren't well known. And now they are. Authority is not truth. Truth is authority. And you can have as many blue rooms as you want. And it still, it doesn't mean you have authority. It doesn't mean you have trust. Or you could do the Klaus Schwab plan and get to the bestseller list by having so many people hate you, but also buy your book <laughs> that you just climb through the bestsellers list and everyone knows they hate you. Klaus Schwab has sold so many books of hate that he's now an authoritative source on hateful, on hateful literature. literature. Klaus, thank you. Uh, just go to Amazon and look for COVID-19, The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab and Thierry Malloray. That's COVID-19, The Great Reset. Uh, it's there. It's a great summer vacation read. Wow. They can have fun with their conspiracy theory. I, it does just go to show you, though, that you can't buy trust, can you? As much as they've tried. We should notice that it's from among us, the ordinary people, that the farmers and the truckers come, so that it's we who really have the power that matters in the end.